sea. So good morning uh, and thank you for attending the webinar today. Today we have the, the webinar from the Biomembranes uh, group that is led by Barbara Ormeda. <clears throat> thank you, Barbara, for organizing the, this, this webinar today. And if you want, you can introduce the, the speaker. Thank yes, of course. Thank you, Mar, for organizing these webinars. Um, well, our speaker is Sara Garcia Linares. Sara got her PhD in biochemistry and molecular biology in the Complutense University in Madrid under the supervision of professors Álvaro Martínez del Pozo and José Gavilanes. And she elucidated the mechanism of pore formation of actinoporins. Uh, then as a postdoc, Sara moved to Harvard Me Medical School to the laboratory of Professor Adrian Salik. And there she characterized a membrane protein involved in the hedgehog pathway of cell signaling. After two years there, she came back to Madrid. And now she's assistant professor at the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology of Complutense University. Her research has been mainly centered in the study of toxic proteins of sea anemones and insects, and with a particular focus in their inter interaction with biological membranes and the role of lipids. Uh, besides, besides this, Sara is also a very active scientist in divulgation, as some of you may know. And she's also a professional musician. She's a violin player, and she participates in several orchestra. And today, Sara is going to talk us about an interesting new application of her background in toxic uh, proteins, which is the design of membrane pore based nanoreactors for plastic depolymerization. So, Sara, uh, thank you very much for accepting our invitation and welcome to the webinar. It's a pleasure to have you here today. Oh, thank you. Thank you for inviting me, Barbara, and the rest of the Biomembranes group. Uh, if, if that's okay, I'm going to share my screen. Okay, I'm going to hide this. Okay. So, is it okay? Okay. Sorry. Yeah, perfect. Okay, so good morning, everyone. As Barbara said, I'm Sara Garcia Linares, assistant professor at the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology at Complutense University. And I'm going to present my work on the design of pore based nanoreactors for plastic depolymerization. So, in short, I'm going to tell you how we have transformed a pore forming protein with no catalytic activity whatsoever into a biological nanoreactor capable of degrading one of the most common plastic compounds in our industry, which is PET, that stands for polyethylene terephthalate. So to begin this story, our research group studies toxic proteins since the early 2000s. And in particular, we uh, studied uh, toxic proteins from the sea anemones venom. Sea anemones are animals that live attached to rocks or to the bottom of the ocean by their petal bees. So they are sessile animals, they cannot move. And they also um, have this cavity, the oral disc, which is where they digest their prey. They usually feed on small crustaceans and fish. So how do they capture their prey or fight against their predators if they cannot move? Well, another part of the sea anemone uh, uh, anatomy are the tentacles. And in the tentacles, we can find a specialized type of cell called nidocyte, which is the stinging cell. And inside the nidocyte, we can find these, um, these organelles called nematocysts, which contains the venom. So before, let me, yeah, the, pump, the pointer. Um, as I was saying, the nematocyst is the organelle that contains the venom. So when a stimuli triggers this thing called nidocil, the lid of the cell pops open and the nematocyst shoots out like, like a sphere. It's a really fast uh, process. So uh, I love to use this animation by Ted to illustrate this process because it is magnificent. So 
Here you can see several neurocytes with the nematocysts perfectly coiled inside the cell under a high osmotic pressure. So if an external stimuli, chemical or mechanical, as we are going up, up, about to see, this poor fellow touches the neurocyl, so the lid of the cell pops open, seawater rushes in, and that forces the, the nematocysts to uh, decoil, to penetrate and inject the venom into the victim, which feels an intense pain. So what is this venom? So as mm, the majority of venoms in the animal kingdom, the venom is a mixture of different compounds. And most of them are toxic polypeptides or small proteins of around 200 amino acids. And in the sea anemone's venom, we can find neurotoxins, which as their name indicate, are toxic to neurons. And they are responsible for the pain that we feel if we touch one of these animals. It also contains phospholipases that degrade the phospholipid um, from our cell membrane. And it also contains cytolines, which are proteins that make pores into the cell. And inside this last group, we can find a family of proteins called actinoporins. And they are called that way because they make pores and they belong to the actinaria order. Actinaria order comprises the anemones, jellyfish, and also coral. So actinoporins have been isolated from at least 20 different species of sea anemone, but only four of them have been extensively studied and we know them at the atomic level. Those four actinoporins are echinotoxin 2 from Actinia echina. This anemone, we can find it usually in the coast of Western Europe and in the Mediterranean Sea. Cicolysins 1 and 2, both produced by the same sea anemone, Cicodactyl alianthus from the Caribbean Sea and Fragasia toxin C from the anemone Axia fragasia or the strawberry anemone for the look of, of, the, of the anemone. And this one is found all the way from the coast of Norway to Africa. And as you can see in this drawing, all of them share an almost identical three-dimensional structure composed by this beta motif and two alpha helices flanking. Um, about the pore formation mechanism of actinoporin, this is still a matter of study, but there are key aspects of the process that are commonly accepted so far. So actinoporins remain stable folded as monomers when they are in a solution. But if they encounter a membrane of the right composition, they can bind to it. And when I say the right composition, uh, the main requisite for this is the presence of a sphingomyelin. So, if we study actinoporin binding to a membrane by, for example, in this case, isothermal titration calorimetry, we will get a nice binding curvature as long as we have a sphingomyelin present. As opposed to if we don't have a sphingomyelin, there is absolutely no binding of the actinoporin to the membrane. So that is very important. After the actinoporin has bound to the membrane, the N-terminal alpha helix extends parallel to the membrane and inserts into the membrane at the same time while several monomers oligomerize to form the final transmembrane pore, which is a cation selective pore that creates an ionic imbalance inside the cell that ultimately, ultimately leads to the cell's death. And the beauty of these proteins is that this whole process takes place with no external energy supply whatsoever and no changes in the protein sequence. So that makes it a very interesting thermodynamic puzzle. And a few years ago, because we know the soluble structure of the four actinoporins for many years, but it wasn't until 2015 when this work by Tanaka et al came out in Nature Communications that we got the first transmembrane pore structure for an actinoporin, in this case, Francia toxin C. As you can see, uh, the, the pore is composed of eight monomers of the uh, actinoporin, and you can see in the lateral view how, how the four walls are composed of the eight helices, but also of the lipids of the membrane that appear in between the helices. So this is a very, very nice work. This is a very complete structure, but it has a few drawbacks. 
the main one being that this was a structure um, obtained by crystallization of the pork. And that was made in the presence of lipid mimic detergent. So it is a very good structure, but it's not completely true to the biological process. So many years ago, uh, our research group started to use, uh, started to use nanodisc. And for those of you who are not familiar with these particles, nanodiscs are a lipid platform composed by a phospholipid bilayer stabilized by two copies of this amphipathic membrane scaffold protein, which uh, protects the aliphatic chains of the phospholipid from the alcohol solvent. So to make nanodis, um, you just have to mix the scaffold protein and the lipid mixture dissolved in detergent. And then you have to remove the detergent either by dialysis or size exclusion chromatography. So during dialysis, during detergent removal by one of these methods, you could see at first how the phospholipids were creating micelles to stabilize themselves. But as long as we keep removing the detergent, at some point, the phospholipids begin to form this lipid bilayer. And this is possible because the presence of the scaffold protein, which is antipathic, so the hydrophobic site protects the aliphatic chains of the phospholipid, and the hydrophilic site faces the alcohol solvent. So the result is a particle of nanometric size, which is completely soluble in alcohol solvent. So we used these nanodisc platforms to add our actinoborins and reconstitute the transmembrane pore. In this case, we are reproducing the, uh, the real thing, the biological process. A membrane was already there and we add an actinoborin. No detergent present at any time. And in collaboration with Jaime Martin Benito from CMB and Ernesto Arias, more recently from CIB, we got uh, cryo-electron microscopy images of these pores into the nanodisc. And these are very early, low resolution two dimensional images of those pores. But even though they are low resolution, you can see the different monomers of the protein. And same as in the 2015 crystal structure of Rasatoxin C, because in this case, this uh, structure is by stigalizing two. But in both cases, we have eight monomers forming the pore. And you can even intuit in this frontal view the, uh, the N terminal of a helix inserting down into the membrane. And in this lateral view, you can see the protein core, the helix inserting into the membrane, and this would be the density of the nanodisc. So after many years of work, millions of image, images processed, we got a three dimensional structure with subatomic resolution, actually this one got even better. This is a, a, a former one. But we have subatomic resolution, which means that this structure allowed us to identify atomic interactions between particular residues in the protein and the lipids from the membrane. So in this case, we have a very, a very uh, more accurate information about lipid protein interaction. And this amazing work is being prepared for a manuscript at the moment. So this is where we are in our research group. And a couple of years ago, Victor Waya from the Barcelona Supercomputing Super Center, he contacted us with a very interesting project. So Victor Waya and his team have developed a software of their own creation called PELE, which is the acronym for Protein Energy Landscape Exploration, because it is what the software does. It explores energy landscapes for proteins and for protein ligand interaction. So this software, which is open and free for academics, you can find it in their website. Um, how it works, it is based on three main steps. The first is a initial perturbation of the system, then a side chain sampling, and a final minimization step. So for ligand fitting experiments, the uh, initial perturbation starts with a random translation and rotation of the ligand. And it also might include the backbone of the protein. So this part of the algorithm tries to uh, mimic the, the movement of the protein when it binds to the ligand. 
During sidechain side sampling, the algorithm places all sidechains local to the ligand with a Rotomer library sidechain optimization. And the algorithm has an aesthetic filtering to eliminate the Rotomers that are not possible. And in a final step, there's a minimization of a user-defined region, which is usually a full protein, with a truncated Newton minimizer. Uh, I'm not expertise in this area, so please don't ask very hard questions on this. So these three steps, all of them compose a move that is either accepted, defining a new energy minima, or rejected based on metropolis criterion. Again, I'm no expert, but this is basically you get the three steps and a final energy value. If that value is in accordance to the other obtained in the same uh, process, it is accepted. But if the value is too high, it's rejected. So Victor's idea was using the information that we have from the crystal structure of acetoxin C, use the Pella software to predict what mutations we needed to make in the pore forming protein to introduce a catalytic triad capable of hydrolyzing some kinds of esters. And this was his idea, and they run the simulations with the information from the fragacetoxin fragacet structure, and they obtained a list of potential mutants with this hydrolytic activity. The mutations that they predicted were located mainly in three regions of the protein, the uh, beta region, the region that interacts with the membrane, and also the N-terminal alpha heat. So they had this list of mutants, and in our group, a toxic proteins group in Complutense University, we selected one of those mutants, the most promising ones, based mainly um, in structure stability criteria. So once we decided what mutants we had to do, we produced them using an E. coli system. And this was possible thanks to the group in the Basque Country, which resolved the Prasetosin C structure, who generously handed us the plasmid to make this work. And after production of the proteins, we performed the purification using standard protocols that have been optimized during the years in our laboratory. And we had a very good yield in the purification of both wild-type Prasetoxin C and the first mutant uh, that Victor and his team predicted. So after purification of the protein, we needed to make sure that the mutations didn't uh, change the soluble structure of the monomer first. So we performed circular dichroism experiments to test the integrity of the soluble structure of the monomer. So you can see both in the far UV spectra and the near UV spectra that the uh, structures of the mutant and the white type are indistinguishable. So we were sure that the soluble structure was, was okay. But, and this is something I didn't mention, the catalytic triad that we are looking for, it's only there if we have a pore, because it is composed of two amino acids of one helix and a third amino acid from the adjacent helix. So we don't have the catalytic triad only with a monomer. We need to have the pore. So for that, we needed to make sure that our mutant was still able to make force. It was active in terms of pore formation. And for that, we resorted to one of the most common experiments used in the action of this field to assess pore formation, which is hemolysis, which is uh, the lysis of red blood cells. And you can see the mutant is a dashed line, although it is less efficient than the white type protein. This usually happens when you make a mutant. The mutant is still active, and it remains active at different pH values. So the soluble structure was OK, and our mutant was able to make pores. The next step was to reconstitute that pore in the proper lipid platform. So yes, you guessed all right, we restored it to nanodisc. So for this experiment, we made an anodisc using a particular membrane scaffold protein and a complex lipid mixture. If you remember, the presence of a sphingomyelin is essential for acting opponents to bind to the membrane. And also the presence of cholesterol, it's very useful in terms of enhancing pore formation. This has been proven uh, a lot many times over the years. So we had our 
nanodisks, we purify the nanodisk, and then we add our actinoborin. And first we did by SDSH, checking that both the scaffold protein from the nanodisk and the actinoborin were present in the sample. But then we had to make sure that the pore was actually there. So in this case, by ourselves, we made um, negative staining electron microscopy imaging. And you can see here two particles where you can distinguish very, very well the nanodisc with the pore. You can see the hole, like a kind of nano donut, uh, as opposed to this one, for example, which is an empty nanodisc or this one. But we had a pretty recent population of nanodisc with a pore. So our nano reactor is there, ready to use. The mutant pore reconstituted into the nanodisc, all completely soluble and no detergent. So the next obvious step was to check if the pore had actually the catalytic capacity. And for that, we used nanoparticles of PET. If you remember, that's our main goal, depolymerizing PET. And we followed the appearance of the most common degradation products for PET. And those are these hydroxyacyl terephthalate, more um, both monomers and dimers. MHET, which is monohydroxyacyl terephthalic acid, and the final degradation product, which is terephthalic acid. So we follow the appearance of, of all of them. And this part we did in collaboration with a group of Manuel Ferrer at the Institute of Catalysis and Petroleochemistry. And they used a substrate nanoparticles of PET, uh, two versions. They used PET nanoparticles from a bottle. I think it was granini juice. And PET nanoparticles uh, from commodity, they call it, this like commercial PET. So in this case, they use, um, they use HPLC to follow the appearance of the product. So in this case, we only have MHAT and VHAT, where, uh, which you can see here how from zero hours to 72 hours, which is the red line, we uh, see a very high increase in the concentration of MHET, BETT, the monomer, and also the dimer, which occurs at 24 hours. And you can see here in the graph. And that happened both with bottle nanoparticles and commercial nanoparticles. You can see how the products increase. You can also see that the concentration of terephthalic acid is very, very low, almost inexistent. And you can see this as an inconvenient, like we didn't go all the way into the, uh, the degradation. But it is actually an advantage because BHET is the main source, uh, is the main uh, precursor for PET polycondensation in the recycling industry. So actually, it is a very, um, very useful product. Um, oh, okay. They also use Raman spectroscopy to check the appearance of the degradation products, again, with the bottle PT nanoparticles and commercial PT nanoparticles. And you can see here in green, this is the band corresponding to PET and how it decreases with time until 72 hours. Uh, Why the uh, main degradation products, the red line is BHET monomer, the yellow one BHET dimer, and the blue one, MHAT, all of them increase with time until, until 72 hours, both in the bottle and the commercial PET nanoparticles. So two things are important to remark at this point. One, that as a control, we used white type paracetoxin C pores and mutant paracetoxin C monomers in solution. Neither of them showed any activity whatsoever. So this catalytic activity is specific for the mutant nanopores reconstituted into the nanos. And also, all these experiments were performed at neutral pH and 40 degrees temperature. So we don't need extreme conditions to achieve PET degradation, which is a main advantage. So I hope I, I showed you that uh, we transformed successfully a non-catalytic actinoporin into a biocatalytic nanoreactor that is capable of degrading PET nanoparticles. And this work is uh, currently under third revision in nature catalysis 
there's a one of the reviewers still not convinced by some of the aspects, uh, but we we hope to see it published uh, very soon, and we are very excited about the the results. Um, because I I have a few minutes left, I also wanted to tell you about our last uh, collaborative project to show you the potential of these uh, whole form proteins. And to introduce this part, I wanted to use this wonderful image. I don't know if you are familiar with the PDB calendar, but they, they publish it every year and it's free to download and you can print it. And this is the December image for the PDB calendar, which is uh, very convenient. This uh, curious structure is uh, it's called a protein cage. And in this particular case is the trap cage, nothing to do with the so-called musical style. And, and these boxes are made in the laboratory for many different purposes, uh, in both in medicine and synthetic biology and material sciences. And they have this curious cubic geometry that was thought to be impossible. And the architect of these cages is Professor Jonathan Hedel from the Jagiellonian University in Krakow. So the idea is to collaborate with them to make protein cages, in this case, using our actinoborins. And this collaboration has been possible thanks to the UNANO project, uh, which is funded by the UNA Europa Initiative and implicates eight European universities. So in this case, between Krakow and Complutense, we want to do this, this work. And what is the advantage of using our actinoborins to build these cages? Well, if you remember the pore formation mechanism by actinoporins, we have the soluble monomer, it binds to the membrane, then terminal alpha helix extends and inserts to, to the membrane, and then oligomerization occurs, and we have a pore. So, if we prevent the end terminal alpha helix extension, the pore won't be formed. And how can we do that? Well, actinoporins don't have any cysteine residues which is very convenient because it means that if we artificially introduce two cysteine residues at the right positions, we can form a disulfide bond and prevent the N-terminal alpha helix extension. So if we perform hemolysis experiment with Y-type acetylacin 2, we have a very nice cure, very active. But if we do the experiment with one of these mutants, we can see that the activity is completely abolished. But, and this is one of the most beautiful experiments that we have performed lately, if we incubate the mutant with a reducing agent and then perform the, the hemolysis experiment, we recover completely the hemolytic activity. And more so, if you do the hemolysis experiment with the uh, inactive pore, and then after you add the reducing agent, you can still recover part of the activity. Which means that hypothetically, if we build one of these protein cages with our actinoporins, we will have a cage that could be open and closed at will using or not the reducing agents. And I say hypothetically because we are in a very early stage of this project, but we will see how it works. And if it works fine, I promise to, to tell you in a, in a uh, next seminar. So with that, I just wanted to thank our Toxic Proteins group, which as you can see for now, it's not very big, but we are very committed to the work. And especially I wanted to thank Rafa. Uh, he, he's no part of the group officially anymore, but he was a former student of us. Um, and he made a pretty um, a, a great part of the work that I presented today during his bachelor's and his, his master's thesis. So, I wanted to thank him, even though for now he, he's not with us anymore. And with that, I just wanted you to thank you for, I wanted to thank you for your attention and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Nice work, Sarah, very nice presentation. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah, very nice presentation. Um, I don't know. I'm looking at the chat of the Zoom session 
and I can't see any question yet. So maybe, That's bad. Yet, yeah. Yeah. maybe yeah. I can start asking you some questions I have for you. Sure. Um, well, uh, first thing, congratulations. I liked a lot the work. I, I previously know, knew about this. But it was uh, it's a very interesting all you have uh, talked about. Okay. Um, in concrete, the part of the protein cages that I didn't know. I think it's a very promising um, research. Uh, yes, please let us know. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, it's very interesting. And and in general, all the work with. Uh, with this phrase mutant mm -hmm. I think it, it's um, a clear example about collaboration uh, uh, with different um, researchers from other fields that sometimes uh, all of us that are working are very I don't know basic research uh, we sometimes lack this part of um, <coughs> translation of the yeah of our research so congratulations and i enjoy it a lot and so i wanted to ask you um because you have done this collaboration with the fras with the fra mutant now that you also have the structure of the of your protein of the sticolysin mm -hmm. uh, are you going to do something with this yeah, because, actually that's good. oh sorry <laughs> yeah no the structure you have Publish or you are about to pub to publish. Yeah. So, so congratulations for this. Yeah. Also. yeah. Well, we'll see. We'll see. We are still working on the manuscript. Well, but but at least you have the structure, which is. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It, and it's amazing. The images are it's like amazing. yeah. Because this has been a work that started in 2011. So uh, both the technique and and the uh, the uh, microscopes have evolved tremendously during those yeah. years. So seeing the project evolve. Uh, it, it's been amazing and the last results we are like super excited like we we can naturally see atoms interacting with other atoms mm -hmm. and it's crazy yeah this is nice so yeah going back to your question yes we would like to do this especially with sticolizing too because many years ago we did a, a paper in collaboration with the Basque country that had um, fragacetoxin C and Slovenia they had echinatoxin too they handed us the proteins and I did a comparative work because there was a lot of done with all of them in, uh, separately, but we wanted to see how they work like yeah. in an experiment in parallel. Mm -hmm. And sticolizing two, um, it's like uh, the best of them. Like it's more active, it's quicker doing pores. It's so it's so much better at, at everything. So we are like really excited to, to try sticolizing two. But we are also exploring the possibility to use other uh, performing proteins because one of the drawbacks, uh, and this was a proof of, of concept until very recently, but it works so well. Um, and this part is kind of small. That is why we need to use PET nanoparticles as substrate. So we are exploring to use performing proteins with a much bigger pore uh, size. Which size is that. the pore? Uh, this is like eight nanometers, in the, no, twelve in the in the bigger part, twelve nanometers. So it's it's quite small for some things, but we are exploring bigger pores to have a uh, different substrate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very interesting. Yeah. So, and and I wanted also to to ask you about the yield of these nanoparticles, nano that disk of RACI because I, I know what is to work with membrane proteins and with nanodisks and yeah. in order to, to, to get, um, yeah, for the future, mm -hmm. I think the gel, the gel would be important. Um, See, so, so, yeah, um, we have a very nice advantage, which is our membrane protein is very special because it's soluble in aqua solution. Yeah. So most of people, when they reconstitute a membrane for using nanodisc, they had to mix everything. The scaffold protein, the lipids, and the uh, protein of study, all of them, and then reconstitute everything together. But we have the advantage that we have the 
purely finalities and we add our acting appointments. So that's an advantage in terms of the yield. And it also, <clears throat> so, so far we've used the nanodisc cores to do cryo-electron microscopy and to do the, um, the catalysis experiments. And both of them need a very few concentrations. So they don't need, actually, we were worried at first, like, oh, we don't have enough. And they were like, we had to dilute this like 10 times. So for now, this is not an issue. But yes, if we want in the future to apply these, like to, I don't know, like clean waters or something, um, I guess we will have to work in, an, in scaling the process. And there's a very nice uh, tool that we could use because the scaffold protein has an ISTA. Uh, for its purification. So we could use an affinity column to get mm -hmm. the, uh, the nanodisc particles. Mm -hmm. okay. So we yeah. have a question from, from the audience. Uh, Lucia Garcia, you have congratulations from Lucia Garcia Ortega, from Jose Manuel Garcia Pichel, and also for, for, from Ana Saborido. And Lucia is asking you, um, uh, she says, I have a question regarding the catal catalysis with the pore. Are you able to know if substrates have a preferential side of the pore? We, we, uh, we um, understand that the nanoparticles get through the big side of the pore, yeah. but actually nothing impedes them to go the other side. Yeah. Actually, it's, it's a both way process. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I have a question also, just a technical question, because finally you are having one a protein that is uh, making pores just in the membrane that you are reconstituting in the nanodisc. And this is difficult to, to obtain, no? because finally it's not one protein that is inserting and nothing more, not, it's causing a pore and it's disturbing the lipid. So any advice uh, about the percentages of, of lipids or uh, have you needed to try many concentrations or uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah as I, as I said we started this in 2011 yeah. uh, I, I had been in the laboratory for two years until then and the, the initial steps were uh, a nightmare like the first time we tried to introduce a single mangling it was a complete disaster and none of these were nowhere to be found and the uh, yield was really, really low. Uh, and we had to try, like, uh, we started with um, this book chapter, which is the Bible for nanodis by Sligar et al. And they talk about the uh, proportion, the, the ratio of, of lipid and membrane scaffold protein. And we started using that as model. And uh, as long as we moved, we, we kept changing things and changing the composition. and until it worked. Like yeah. it was it was thinking, but also a lot of try and error. And how do you test the, the percentage of protein that is incorporated in the nanodis? How do you check how many nanodis have the protein, which is the technique that you, you are using? When we go to the microscope. Yeah, then you can when, observe and-, and so they, pick, they pick the ones with the holes yeah. to use it for their reconstitution. Okay, okay. okay. So you, you don't need, before uh, going to the microscope, you don't need to know if... if yeah. No. Uh, at, at some point, we tried to purify the uh, preparation afterwards, and that was a very bad idea. When, when we took the samples to the microscope, they said, like, I don't know what you did this time, but this was awful. Yeah. So now we, we take them, the, uh, the whole thing, the, the empty nanodies, the ones with pores, and they just pick the images, which now I think it's pretty automatic. Not at first. At first yeah. it wasn't. But yeah. now it's pretty straightforward. Okay. okay. And, and one, one question they have that is a curiosity is why uh, the, 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 your, your collaborators selected a transfer main protein to do the catalysis of, of to do this catalysis, why not a soluble protein? Yeah, uh, actually, there are a few soluble proteins. So I guess they wanted to have like a platform to who could be fixed uh, into something uh, uh, attached to something. Yeah. So like this was like the the main idea was Victor's, and we were like, oh yes, this, this sounds right, and also. 
with a soluble protein, you have one catalytic triad. Yeah. In the yeah. nanopore, you have several of them in one particle. Yeah. Um, so you have, like, you, you multiply the uh, catalytic effect. It's really nice uh, work, this, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank so, you. Uh, and activity in a plasma membrane protein. This is really amazing, yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you know if, if they have also tried with other proteins? Um, I, um, I, I'm sure they probably. have, but I think it's, this is the first membrane protein. I mm -hmm. think they have tried to do the uh, mutations in soluble proteins. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think Lucia had another question. Uh, um, she said, uh, would not it be interesting to control that somehow, referring to the previous question about the, the catalysis? Um, One side or the other. About the, pref oh, yeah, the yeah. preference um, of substrates. That may I mean, be, I, I'm, be I'm useful pretty to sure, control this. Yeah, I'm pretty sure they go through the big side because I, 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 I'm not sure the uh, nanoparticles fit through the other one. Yeah. But we haven't thought of uh, checking that because actually we don't care that much which side the particles get into the pore. We just needed to get through it. Yeah. yeah because it depends. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In case we did this uh, in a liposome, which is also something that we are considering, we're considering, there it would be important. Yeah. Because if your contaminant is going to be outside, you need the contaminant to go through the right side because otherwise nothing is going to happen. But for now, since this is a soluble particle and all of it is in contact with the media, we don't care that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And as, as far as I understood, what you are thinking is in recycling, not in eliminating the contamination, no? But also in recycling this. Well, yeah, so th that, that also came along the way, like, oh, we don't have the final product. And Manuel was like, no, that's actually a good thing because we could use the product for the recycling of the plastic. <laughs> Okay, so very nice. Thank you, Sara. I think um, we don't we have, have any questions, no? No. No. So, yeah, thank you very much for, for accepting for, for our invitation. It was an amazing work. And okay. thank you, Mark, also. Thank you, Barbara, also for organizing the, the meeting. And thank you, Sara. The, the talk has been really amazing. And, and for the audience, thank you for being here and also thank you for uh, making questions. And uh, we wait uh, you in the next webinar. And uh, bye. Bye, thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.